to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. James 5.16 says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We welcome you today to our study of the beautiful book of James, all about practical, real Christianity. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We hope you'll find your Bible and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. We want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by uh, members and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a, a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church, maybe learn about what they teach uh, from the Bible on salvation, you'll find people there who would be happy to sit down and open up the Scripture and think about God's Word with you. Friend, we also want you to know that here at the Gospel of Christ, that's what we're concerned about. We're not concerned about your money. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about many of the things that people of the world are concerned about. We want to help men and women get to heaven. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. All of our material is on our website. Every lesson we've done in video and audio, uh, transcripts, written material, just a good host of Bible study material is all available 24-7 from our website, and we encourage you to check that out. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on the book of James, we want to invite you to go to our website, Fill out a media request form, and we'll be happy to send that to you free of charge. If you need it in DVD or CD form, we'll even mail that to you free of charge. And as always, we want to encourage you to check out our app for mobile phones, both in the Android and Apple Store. You can look up the Gospel of Christ app there as well. Today, we're finalizing our study in the book of James with a look at the living messages of James 4 and James 5. Now, let's back up for just a moment and remind ourselves of the beautiful theme that runs through the book of James. James 1 verse 22 says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Faith without works is dead. James chapter 2 verse 17. And so the book of James is all about an active a live faith that is a doer of the word, someone who's trying to take their Christianity to God's glory and put it to use in their everyday life. And so we're so glad that you've tuned in. Open your Bible up, if you would, to James chapter 4. And James is going to begin in chapter 4 by showing us that some of the great problems that we face in this life are due to worldliness. You know, sometimes I hear people talk about problems that we face in the church, uh, denominationalism, uh, antiism, uh, social, whatever the problem may be. But you know, one of the greatest problems in the church is worldliness. We've got to realize this world is not our home. We really are just passing through. And that's what James wants these Christians to see. You see, in the background of James, there are evidently some problems going on. James chapter 4, verse 1, James says, most problems that we face with our members come from our, our own lust. And if it's not from our own lust, we don't have because we don't ask. And if it's because we ask, we don't receive it sometimes because we ask for the wrong reason that we may spend it on our pleasures. And so it seems like these people are in some ways eat up with worldliness, problems over stuff, asking and asking for the wrong reason and, and not thinking about others. And James just kind of brings it to a head in James 4 verse 4. I want you to notice this passage in your Bible. It is the single strongest passage on worldliness in the Scripture. James 4, look at what the Bible says in verse number four. Adulterers 
and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Can I have the best of both? Can I live it up and have every pleasure and be involved in it and then try to be a good Christian too? You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6 verse 24? You cannot serve God and worldly pleasures. It's just not possible. Friend, if I'm going to be dedicated to the cause of Christ, I've got to realize the world and all its allurements, that can't be my focus because that's liable to drag me down. Let me give you some examples. Wisest man to ever live by the name of Solomon. God gave him wisdom from on high. More than anybody has ever had before, more than anybody will ever have again. What did he do with that wisdom? Worldliness caused him to squander it. In 1 Kings chapter 10 and 11, Solomon is building places of worship for his wives' false gods, and he's up there as well. What happened to Solomon? Well, seven, 300 wives and 700 concubines sure didn't help. Worldliness got into his own life. Think about people in the New Testament. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. Man had a great crop year. He began to say to his soul, Soul, you've got many goods laid up for many years. He, he tore down his barns, built bigger barns, and he just took it easy. There wasn't anything wrong with having a good year. There wasn't anything wrong with building bigger barns. But here's where it went sideways. So you've got many goods laid up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. You know what that one man forgot? God said to him, You fool! This night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you've acquired? And here's the point Jesus made. So is he who is rich, but not toward godliness. What did that man forget? Oh, he planted his field. He planned for the year ahead. He had a great crop year. Everything was going his way except he forgot the most important thing. He didn't take care of his soul. You know what Jesus said? Mark 8, verse 36 and 37, Jesus taught us the soul is the most important thing. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's say you could have all the wealth in the world, you had every pleasure you wanted, you had the biggest house, the biggest truck, you were living the high life. Then you had a heart attack and died. And you forgot to take care of your soul. Where would you be for eternity? You see, my friend, the world can cause us to lose focus on what's really important. It can even cause religious people to lose focus on what's important. How do I know that? Give you an example of a man that it did it to. Mark chapter 10. All we know him by is the rich young ruler. And boy, I wish we could find a lot more people with questions like this. He comes to Jesus with a great question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do to go to heaven? Love to find a lot of people like that, wouldn't we? Jesus said, keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. All those I've done from my childhood. One thing you lack. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Come follow me. You'll have treasures in heaven. You know what Mark 10 tells us about verses 17 through 21? That man went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Here's a religious man who spent his whole life trying to follow the law, trying to follow God, and he let the world and all his stuff get in the way of him going to heaven. Friend, let's realize there's nothing wrong with having things of this world, nothing wrong with enjoying good things of this world, and nothing wrong with having wealth. Or th that's not what we're saying. But if we let it get in front of and get in the way of and cloud what really matters, my soul and going to heaven, and it can very easily do that, then friend, we're not doing what God wants us to do. And James tells us in James 4 verse 5, God doesn't want that because He's a, a jealous God. The Spirit who yearns in you yearns jealously. God wants us to be saved and go to heaven. And so we've got to be very careful that we put our heart in our life in the right place. And where is the right place? In a place of humility. Look at James chapter 4 
And I want you to notice about verses 6 through 8. Look in James chapter 4. The, to counteract worldliness and problems, we need a good dose of humility. James says, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now notice verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. How do we counteract the problems of worldliness? Friend, I need a good dose of humility. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction. You know what the problem is with all this stuff that we acquire? We think that somehow it makes us more able. It makes us more powerful. And if we're not careful, we can think it makes us who we are. But you know who I really am? I'm a creation of God. And one day, I'll stand before the almighty throne of God and give an account. Humility helps me in that it causes me to realize I need God and my dependence upon Him. And that without God, no matter what I've got, without God, I'm nothing. A good dose of humility sure does go a long way and overcoming sin, and defeating the devil, and really being what God wants us to be on so many different levels. Now let's turn our attention to another powerful example in James chapter 4. And this is the example of those who, as it relates to worldliness especially, they're not thinking about the will of the Lord in their daily lives. Here's the illustration. James is so good at giving us uh, visual illustrations. And notice the one in James 4 verse 13. James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such city, spend a year there, buy, sell, and make a profit. James says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does not do it. James says, to him it's a sin. You think about, again, another vivid illustration. A couple of guys get together. They concoct a plan. They've got a product they need to sell. And they say, we're going to move to this city. We're going to buy and sell. We're going to sell this product. We're going to push it. We're going to promote it. And we're going to make it big. We're going to make a lot of money off that. Wouldn't be anything wrong with coming up with a product people need. Wouldn't be anything wrong with selling it. Wouldn't even be anything wrong with making a profit off of it. What was the problem? James says, whereas you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. What do you mean, James? And then he says this. But what is your life? It's but a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. These people are so caught up in worldliness that they haven't considered the brevity of life. When James uses the phrase, it's but a vapor, your life is but a vapor, in the original text, that's a very interesting word. It means the, it's like the dew that's on the grass is kind of how we would describe it. Tomorrow when you go out in the morning, very likely, on the grass, there might be a, a little coating of dew. About 10 o'clock, maybe 11. Where will that dew be? In a few hours. It vanishes just like that. Friend, that's the picture of our life. We've got to realize, at best, 70, maybe 80 years. Psalm 90, verses 10 through 12. Life is, flies by so fast, and we've got to be careful that we don't miss out on what's most important. You know, a person, this is so easy. we got so much going on. My life and yours, we've got so much going on. You're involved in things. Your kids are involved in things. You, you've got hobbies. You've got interests. And we can get spread so thin and involved in so many things that we forget. Hey, I'm here to get to heaven. That's what it's all about. We lose sight of what life why did God put me on this earth? It's my one chance to live for God and prayer, prepare for eternity. And we realize sometimes before it's too, before we have time to do anything about it, if we're not careful, 
that we've missed out. And so here's what James says. Instead of saying, we're going to move to such and such city, do this, do that, make great gain, James says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills. And that's all God wants. What does God want with me and you? God doesn't mind us moving somewhere. God doesn't have a problem with a person making a business venture. God doesn't have a problem with a person making ends meet and even getting a profit out of that. That's not the problem. What does God want? In everything I say and do, in every action I get involved in, in every plan that I make, God wants me to remember, if the Lord wills. What's that phrase all about? You know, sometimes we pray, if it's your will, Lord. What are we talking about there? I want God to be first in every decision I make. I want to think about first and foremost, how's this going to affect God? How's this going to affect the church? How's this going to affect my soul? Don't just pack up the bags and head off. What about the Lord's will? Is that what God really wants me to do? Will this be the best for me and my family and for the kingdom? Will this help me to be a better servant of God? Will it, will it help me to promote the kingdom of God? And then there's that memorable verse that sometimes we disconnect from this passage, but really it's right in the heart of it. James 4, 17. Notice what it says. James says, for therefore, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. We call this the sin of omission, but you know that therefore is there for a reason, right? Why is that there? Because James is connecting it to people who are going through life without factoring God's will in. If I go through life, what's it like to go through my life without factoring God's will in? If I know to do good, put God first, factor His will in, and I don't do it, that's a sin. It's sinful to live a life without putting God in every decision. That's what James is trying to teach here. Now, does that apply to other areas as well? Does this talk about the sin of omission? If I know to evangelize and I don't do it, sure. But in context, that would take care of it any day, anyway, wouldn't it? If I've got God's will before everything I say and do, then friend, that's what the way God wants me to live my life and that's how he wants me to act in each and every way. And so in James 4, we see some powerful teachings about putting God first in everything that we say and do and not getting caught up in this old world. Friend, think about this with me for just a moment. What's going to happen to this world anyway? You ever thought about this? If I put all my interest, a big part of my interest, a big part of my time, all my effort, if I put all that, all my resources into this old world, what's going to happen to it? Would you look in your Bible, hold your finger in the book of James, and I want you to look in 2 Peter, and I want you to see how foolish it is for this world to be our end game. Look at 2 Peter 3. I want you to look in verses 10 through 12. The Bible says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Why? Because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promises, look for a new heavens and a new earth. Friend, one day all this, the tangible touchable, seeable, feelable world, it's gone. Then what? Then what? That's why we want to put God and His will first. Then in James chapter 5, James is going to conclude the book of James by teaching us about the power of patience. Let's begin in verses 10 and 11 by showing us we need patience to to not get discouraged, to not get caught up in the world, to, to, to remain faithful unto death. We need patience, right? Well, let's look at an example of patience. Look in James 5. I want you to look in verses 10 and 11. James says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Let's think about examples of patience. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, 
John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, they never lost sight. Even though they faced difficult things in this life, they never lost sight. And look at how they're heralded today. And then he says, I want you to think of one more with me. And friend, this is such a powerful example that helps us to stay focused, be patient, and not get caught up in the world, right? James says, think of the servant Job, the prophet, the man Job, who endured. You ever just stop and thought about what Job went through? Job was a good man, and that good man lost it all. In one fell swoop, lost everything he owned. Next fail swoop, all of his children are killed. Uh, Job then loses his health. His wife stays around and tells him to curse God and die. And for comfort, the Bible tells us, Job is sitting in the ash pit with a piece of pottery scraping the dead skin off. Well, you talk about a man who had it bad. He had it really bad. What about the end? Job never lost sight, right? Even though bad things happened, he never lost sight. Job was blessed more. Chapter 42 tells us Job was blessed more at the end of his life than the beginning. Why? He never lost sight. Patience is not just, not just waiting. Patience carries the idea of sticking in there, persevering, and never giving up. And friend, with these examples, we also have the power of prayer to help us never give up. Look at James chapter 5, and I want you to notice beginning in verses 13 through 16. James says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. With being patient, I have help. What if a person's cheerful? What if a person's happy? Let him sing songs. What if he's suffering? Let him pray. What if he's sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them come over, anoint him with oil, and the Bible says the oil will save him. Not in what it says. The prayer of faith will save him. And if he sinned, God will forgive him his sins. And then the Bible says this, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. How do I overcome? How do I keep from getting caught up in the world? How do I stay patient and, and never give up? The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Now James is going to put a cherry on top of that when he gives us a final, final illustration. He says, uh, and let me tell you about prayer in essence. He said, I want to talk to you about Elijah. Just paraphrasing, he says, I want to tell you about Elijah. And here's what he says that's so unique. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What's that mean? He was flesh and bones. Elijah was just like me and you in some ways. Elijah prayed and it didn't rain for a long, long time. He prayed again and low on the horizon, here come the rain clouds. What's his whole point? Elijah, just like me and you, realized the power of prayer and he used it to overcome the obstacles and to stay faithful. And so friend, as we think about this idea, let's realize the value of the soul. Let's start by realizing the value of our own soul and then let's look out and realize the value of other souls. Do you know somebody who might have fallen away and their soul's not where it needs to be. Look at the very last words in the book of James. James 5, look in verses 19 and 20. James says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Do you know someone who's fallen away from the Lord? Fallen away from the church? used to be a Christian, but they're not what they need to be, there's an opportunity for me. That person sometimes needs help. If anyone wanders from the truth, here's where you insert yourself, and someone turns him back. Sometimes people need help. Sometimes they need encouragement. Sometimes they just need somebody to say, hey, we want to help you. Where's your life going? What can we do to help you? Here's what you need to know. When you try to do that, and that 
is a good thing. You need to know you've turned saved a soul from death and covered a multitude of sins. And so as we think today about the beautiful book of James, and as we kind of bring this lesson to a climax, let's remember what it's all about. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Faith that does not have works, it's dead. Let's, let's do what we can to, to, to be the kind of people God wants us to be, to overcome our trials, to put our faith into action, to really clamp down on that old tongue that sometimes gets out of control, gets out of control and, and use it to God's glory, to not let this world drag us down and lose sight of what's really important. My friend, let's have the faith to stay true to the end. Let's never, ever give up. If you're not a child of God, we want you to know today that the God of heaven loves you dearly. God loves you so much. He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for you. Whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. God wants you to be saved. We want you to be saved. If you're not a child of God, won't you become one today? What the Bible teaches about salvation is so plain and clear. The Bible teaches you've got to hear the message. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Paul is, or Philip is in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch. And in the distance, uh, he's been talking to him about Jesus. He had to hear the message. And he's been talking to him about Jesus. And in the distance, he sees water. Here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? If you believe with all your heart, you may. That man was ready to change his life. He believed. Are you ready to believe and repent? Luke 13, verse 3, Peter said, if you believe with all, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. They stopped that chariot. They both got out of the water. He went down to the water and baptized him. And that man went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because he had done what Jesus said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, verse number 16. And so we're so glad again that you've joined us. If we can help you in any way, please don't hesitate to contact us. Visit the Church of Christ in your area and join us next week as we're going to study the Word of God together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.